And welcome to a new episode of Digital Coffee Marketing Brew, and I'm your host, Brett Deister, and this week we're going to be talking about Facebook ads and email marketing. Yes, Facebook, the popular but not really popular the younger generation social media that still has pretty good reach as long as you pay for it, so we're going to be talking about that and a little bit about email marketing as well. But this week, I have Nicole with me, and she is experienced with both Mm, that's good thank you so much for having me really excited to be here yeah and the first question is all my guests is are you coffee or tea drinker actually i'm both so i'll generally have one coffee a day i have to have at least one but then the rest of the day i'm generally drinking tea so <laughs> both <laughs> Do you have any, like any specific tea or coffee that you drink or you just drink whatever you can find? So I actually drink a decaf almond latte, which is a really weird one, but I had gut issues. So I swapped to decaf and almond milk and now I, yeah, now it tastes normal. And then tea, I have this weird combination. It's green tea, pear and jasmine. A girl got me on to it in my corporate role seven years ago and I haven't stopped drinking it since. So Yeah. Very random. <laughs> hey, if you like it, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but I gave a brief summary of your expertise. Can you give our listeners a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, of course. So I am the founder and head strategist at the Digital Exchange, and we are a paid ads agency. So we specialize in Facebook and Google ads, and we also teach Facebook ads and SEO. So my, me personally, I actually have marketing, well, I have marketing skills across the board because I was a corporate marketing manager for a long time for a big international organization. So that's kind of where I started with my business. And then over the last five years, we have niched down into those specific areas because they're the areas that we see the highest growth and that we know can help grow and scale brands. Gotcha. So... What is better? Is it going to be Facebook ads or Google ads? Because everybody says you need to be on Google and do Google ads, but not everybody says that you should be on Facebook ads as much as you need to be doing Google ads. Yes, totally. So I'm actually about to do a huge blog on this soon and maybe even a YouTube tutorial. But essentially, it kind of depends on what type of business you have. So if you have something where people a search need to search to find you or there's some kind of urgency. So for example, you're a tradesman where people need to find you straight away. Something like Google would be better. But if you are something where people don't know what to search for you, you may, you know, it may be more top of funnel. So then you need to get brand awareness out. Something like Facebook ads would be more suitable. But generally for most brands, it's really good to have a combined strategy so that you kind of, there's touch points across both platforms. And we know that you often get chased around the internet by, you know, different ads. And if you have a combined strategy, that can kind of happen. So yeah, most brands can usually apply for, like, apply both, for, um, sorry, apply bro, but they are kind of different in terms of where you sit in the sales funnel. So Facebook ads is generally for the top of funnel right down to the bottom, but then Google ads is because their people are using keywords to search for what you sell. It's more middle to bottom of funnel. So is there a specific format that does better on Facebook ads than Google ads? Because like you said, one search and one kind of sort of is search, but is more of visual. I know Google SEO is trying to like get more into the content scoring side, but which, what do you think format works better for Facebook ads? So when you say, do you, when you say uh, what works better, do you mean in terms of what kind of products or services and things like that? Or, or you more just like. The ad side of it, like what, like format, like what is video plays better, oh, is I pictures play better, you. like what? Sorry, I thought that's what you meant actually. So yeah, so in terms of the creative, it actually depends on all, like it actually depends on what you're selling. So everyone would just assume that video would be the most popular, but we test all different types of creative formats. So we'll test reels to use the generated content, the video, different types of videos and talking to camera. And, you know, still images, slideshows, carousels, we test all of those. And 
often you're surprised that the video isn't the most popular. Sometimes, particularly for brands that are the most visual, like interior designers, you could find that an image performs way better than something video, than a video walkthrough. So we always suggest that you um, that you test different things for your brands and see what works best because for each different audience on the platform, you're going to get something, you're going to get a different result. Mm, got you. And with the advent of subscription-based models with all social networks, I mean, Meta has one as well. It, are we going to see a hit in ads? Because I think they may start generating one that actually like has fewer ads or no ads at all. I know X kind of does that in a way. If you get the premium, premium one, you have literally no ads at all. So is this going to affect the ad side of Facebook or do you think majority of people are just going to keep on using the free version? I think most people will probably continue to use the free version. I haven't seen, I don't know a lot of people that are using the subscription versions. I don't know if you do, but I think the vast majority of people will do unless there's some huge draw to using subscription models or the price is, you know, so good. So, and I think it would probably depend on how many ads they start to spit out. If it started to get really annoying and you're getting a lot of them, then it may change. But I think most people are happy to hold on for the five seconds or whatever or hit skip. <laughs> so true yeah. <laughs> and so like what are some of the new things with facebook ads are we going to see like more ai type of like targeting ai generation of content as we've seen some positive and negative effects through x as well we're going to see more ai just creeping into the ad yeah so we're starting to see some really cool ai tools release so some of the more recent ones uh, you've got the text variation feature that's starting to get rolled out into accounts. That's where you say, for example, you can write copy and it will bring give you a number of different options for, you know, the copy that you produced. It'll give you some different variations of that copy based on all the data that it has available. So it's worth giving that a shot to see if the copy that they offer you as a test against what you've provided gets better results. There's also going to be another one, particularly for e-com brands, where it can drop the background out of your image and throw in another background of a different something different. And that is particularly for people who may not have access to a photographer or a graphic designer or be able to edit the images themselves. So it'll just make your images a little bit more exciting. We know that images stop the scroll. So if you can provide all different backgrounds that make your creative a bit more creative then yeah that could be good too in terms of your performance and there's also another feature coming out and basically what it does is it helps you create different ratio aspects of your formats of your particular ad so what that means is if you were to load a story formatted ad it would stretch that image or elongate it on the top and bottom sorry if you were to sorry if you were to load a post which is the square and you wanted to make it a story format, but you didn't want to go into, say, Canva and create it, you could just simply select this button within the Meta Ads Manager and it would elongate the image and you would get a story format and you wouldn't even have to adjust the creative. So these three new features are helping with your performance and your productivity. So it's not only making your job easier by giving you the options available and creating less work, but it's also going to help increase the performance of your ads because Meta is using all the data they have available to help you put these things together. So I would say or recommend giving all of those things a try because they are available freely there for you. You may not be able to see them in your account yet. I've actually just done a walkthrough as well on my YouTube account of these three new features. If anyone wants to see the visual aspect of that. But yeah, definitely worth a shot. We are also seeing new ways where Meta can control the ad a lot more too in terms of like the audiences available and the creatives. So you're basically giving free reign over to them. So we have started testing out those features too and we're starting to see really good results. But often there needs to be a little bit of data in your account and you need to have run some ads in the past so that Meta's got some kind of yeah data to go off. And speaking on that, how do you write that compelling content or ad copy and visuals? Because maybe a small business wants to do that type of thing where Meta 
knows where to like place it. So how do you write it compelling enough where they get you get enough data and then you can let Meta do its thing? Yeah. So I mean, I think when you are writing the creative for your meta ads, we generally like to write our own to start with. So generally you're going to be looking at the key benefits of what you offer to draw somebody in because that's what's going to get them across the line. Then once you've got that, then I would then go ahead and put that into the copy box and see what see what variations Meta brings up. But we always like to kick off our our text or copy with some kind of question. So you, you draw someone in. So it might be something like, are you in the market for this? Or, you know, we call it the call out. So you basically say, or are you looking for this new fitness regime? So then it immediately calls out the person that is going to fit that, that's probably more for service-based. And then when it comes to product-based, generally we go in with something that's a bit more, I guess, on trend because that's what's going to draw someone in, particularly with things that are in like fashion or, you know, baby products, interior design, all those kind of things. So mm. so it's a, would it be better to do like a problem solution type of a ad copy as well, depending on your industry obviously but would that be beneficial as well as like oh you this is really hard to edit a video i have a tool for you oh my gosh i might want to download this or something like that yeah yeah i would test both so i would test going in with say the problem like so you could start out with the problem and call out the problem so are you struggling with xyz or you could just go straight in with the benefit and say we've got this cool new product so generally i would say test both to see what your audience responds to because we can always say, oh, this way would work or that way would work. But why not try both and see if one starts to get you way more results than the other. And then you can start scaling on that particular campaign or ad if it is performing better. And what are the best like, tracking conversions for Facebook? I mean, it might be depending on what you're looking for, but what are the best ways to track those conversions? Is there a Facebook pixel through your website, like whatever you're trying to do or through email marketing, maybe you're trying to grow your list. Are those like key indicators that can help figure out what you need to do to change your copy or whatever? Yeah. So when it comes to changing your copy, obviously. So if someone is clicking your ad then, and going to your website, then generally you know that the ad is compelling. So you can look at your clicks and your click-through rates to start with. And then when they get to your website, it's going to be, and you start getting results. So whether you start getting leads or sales, if you're sending people to your website, half of the component of the result is going to be based on your website and how well that converts as well. But if you're looking solely at just the copy on your ad, you're going to be looking at things like the clicks and the click-through rate, because that is what is compelling someone to click across, click across to your website. But as a, yeah, as I said, once they get to your website, your website is going to be responsible for half of that conversion because that also needs to get them across the line as well. But then once you've got that all together, you'd be looking at your results. So your leads and your sales, and then your return on ad spend. So your ROAS and your cost as well for the acquisition. So how much it costs you to acquire that lead or sale. So I just thought of one thing I should add. So there's a new thing called the conversion API. So a lot of people may not have set theirs up yet. So essentially what used to happen is that Meta used to convert with, sorry, Meta used to communicate with a browser in order to calculate your results. Now, post Apple iOS changes and Apple stopping Meta from having a lot of, you know, ability to be able to get access to the data what Meta has gone and done, has they have created a way for the servers to be able to speak to each other, so Meta to be able to speak to the website server. What that means is we now have more accurate data. So it's really important to connect your conversion API, which you can do in the back end of your website, depending on what kind of website you have. They're all different. We have a tutorial about that as well in YouTube. But essentially, it's really important to get that set up to make sure that the data you're collecting is much more accurate. Mm. And with all that that data collection, would you use Pixel with, let's say, Google Tag Manager or Google Analytics to see where, if they accurately go to your website and if they're actually going to clicking that button on your website, would you use those tools together to really get the whole picture? Yeah, so you can use your website analytics and you can use your Google Analytics. 
Sometimes I say try and stick with one. It is good to kind of check them against each other, but then you will see differences in the way that they measure the data. So, and say, so, you know, when someone considers a, something a session, whether it be if they click off within an hour or that day, like everyone measures things differently. So there's always going to be some disparities, but it is good to have a look at the whole picture, check your analytics, or a lot of people don't have their Google, Google analytics set up, we find. So that is really good to get set up if you can. It's a free tool and get the conversion tracking set up because a lot of that doesn't come already set up. Otherwise, use your website tracking and track that against your Meta Ads Manager. And the pixel, that's, the pixel will pick that up. Particularly now, if you've set up your conversion API, the data is going to be a lot more accurate. So you can even look in the Events Manager section of the Meta Ads Manager and that those purchases and things like and leads that are in there should be directly matching exactly what's in your website. And I mean, talking about that for, for right for the ads, would you use AB testing to figure out which ones are best for you? Because we talked about the copy, but you could think it's like awesome. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, nobody's clicking on that. So how important is A-B testing and how different should each one be? Because you could have drastically different and they both can be terrible at the same time too. Exactly. A-B testing is the paramount for us of meta ads. If you aren't testing your ads, you aren't very, you're very likely not going to bring your cost per lead and sale down and you're not going to increase your row as so your return on ad spend. You're not going to increase your results because you don't actually necessarily know what your customer is going to respond to. Often we are surprised by what they respond to. So it's really important to try really different variations, but then also similar variations. So for example, you could try two images with exactly the, sorry, two of the exact same images, but then you could try say different layover text on the same images and you could get completely two different results. So you might have one without any layover text and one with, and you may get different results. So it's worth testing that even when it comes to copy and headlines. So for copy, you can test, you know, as we mentioned before, going straight in with the solution or the benefit or going problem solution or going short form versus long form. You know, if you have women, you might find that they like more, you know, more content. Whereas if you have men, they might like to read something short. But you never actually know. So test out different variations for absolutely everything that you can from your different audiences to different formats to different types of images and graphics to different copy to different headlines to different call to action buttons. Test something different every week. Run control tests and I guarantee you, you will start to build a really good picture of what your audience responds to and what's going to get you the best results at the lowest possible cost. Yeah. And what are some common mistakes that businesses do when they're actually doing Facebook ads? Because it seems easy to start it up, but do it effectively it doesn't seem to be as easy as what people may think. Yeah. So one of the main, I think one of the biggest things that we see is people pick the wrong objection to start with the campaign objective. So essentially, if you want to get leads, you pick leads. If you want to get sales, you pick sales. What we see a lot of people doing is picking something like a traffic campaign objective. And what that does is they think that it is really good and it's getting them lots of results because it's getting them lots of clicks, but it's not actually getting them the end result of what they're after, which is leads or sales. So make sure you pick the right campaign objective, pick exactly what you want, because essentially Meta will put people in buckets. So for example, if they are someone that likes to spend a lot of money, they'll go into a sales bucket. If there's someone that likes to click buttons, they'll go into a click bucket. So when you select a campaign objective of traffic, it's going to send your ad to all the people that like to click. Whereas if you click the or choose the campaign objective of sales, it'll send your ad to the people who like to spend money. And Meta knows who all of those people are because it has access to all the data. So that's probably the main thing that we see. We also see a lot of people not testing their ads, so they'll just boost a ad off their phone or the app and not use the ads manager. So it's really important to jump in the ads manager where you can and maybe get some training on that because it is a bit more complex than it used to be and you do need to have some skills to run it, but your results will be better. 
So essentially, if you're in the ads manager, it's a lot more powerful and it means that you can AV test a lot of different things, which we just went through, which again can bring your costs down and increase your results. So I'd say they're probably the two main things. Just trying to think if there's something else that comes to mind off the top of my head. I think a lot of the time people will just throw a couple of dollars on and they want to get a sale and then they feel like they're not getting results. If It's important to not overspend on what you can afford. But the thing is, if you have, say, a $100 product and your cost per acquisition is $20 and you're only advertising for $2 a day, it's going to take you at least 10 to 20 days to even get one sale. So it may not be worth it. And the biggest mistake I wanted to touch on is people using ads before they're ready. So meta ads is a scaling tool. It's not necessarily a growth tool. So essentially what it's going to do is it's going to amplify everything that is happening in your website. So if you have a business and it's not getting sales, it's not going to get sales necessarily if you throw money on it with ads. So you want to wait till you have had a decent amount of people coming through your website doors. Your conversion rate is sitting at 2%. So what that means is for every 100 people that have visited, at least two people have converted. And you want to have had a couple of thousand come through the door to make sure that that number is actually tracking right. And when you have that and you know that your idea is validated and people want what you're selling and your website is converting, that's when you put money behind it. Before that, don't bother because you're going to be wasting money. And I have a freebie all about how to run that check. So. Gotcha. And so we know email marketing, I always call it the dinosaur of marketing because emails have been there long before social media was there. So is email marketing still important? Because everybody wants to do the flashy TikTok ads or do the TikTok thing because it's a new popular thing. But how important is email marketing to a business? Email marketing is by far, I would say, the most important because it has a very high return on ad spend. So for every dollar you input, you are getting $35 to $40 on average in return back. So it's the most cost-effective way to advertise. People that are on your email list are very warm. They're very interested in what you have to offer. People don't hand over their email addresses very easily anymore. You're getting direct access to them. One of the first things people check is their email every morning. So you are targeting with your emails the people that are most likely to buy because they've shown the warmest interest before purchase. So it's still super important to be able to email mark, do email marketing. Now, with all the changes in privacy, it's gotten really hard to measure open rates. So we don't really use that metric as much anymore. And now we're using more of like a click metric. So how many people click through to your ads, I'm sorry, click through from your emails to your website or wherever you've sent them, whatever landing page or content you've sent them to, that's important to track. It's very hard now to track the open rates or have accuracy around that data. But yes, the answer is yes. Keep on email marketing. It is worth every penny, even though it's free to do mostly. So it's just your time that it costs you to do. So it's worth investing in. And does it really depend on the generation too? Like Gen X may actually open more millennials probably in the middle and Gen Z is like, ew, email, that's gross. Well, I mean, I think every, see, in everything that we do, everybody needs to have an email. So I think email marketing spans across all generations. So, you know, it's one of those things where you think, oh, are the younger ones using their email or checking it that much or, but yeah, I think it's, they say it's the first thing that majority of people check the moment they wake up. So I know I do for sure. I go straight in and have a look. I mean, the younger ones might look at their social media first, but I think it spans across generations. And as I mentioned earlier, it's got the highest return on ad spend of all marketing. So it's definitely worth investing in. And is different, do you need to do different ad copy or copywriting or writing the the title for each different generation maybe shorter maybe longer should you eight obviously you probably should be a b testing that as well kind of like a b testing for facebook probably should be a b testing your titles or your subject line yeah so generally for everyone you want to keep it relatively short because we say younger people that have a quicker attention span but then older people are generally busier 
So, you know, they might be juggling families and juggling work. So I think in all, you want to keep it short and quick and to the point, and you want to get something that hooks the audience in. And in saying that, you still want to A-B test. So you want it to be, you want it to be a hook. You want it to be not too long. And yeah, you want it to draw the audience in and you want to A-B test. So I think across generations, again, all those same things kind of apply because for different reasons. You know, there's millions of messages out there every day trying to get our attention. So if you want to get the attention of your audience, whoever they may be, you need to make it super interesting and super on point. And, you know, now there is a lot more segmentation that happens with email marketing as well. So it's really good to be able to put people into particular categories so you can personalize the email experience more as well. So that's something else to consider. You don't want to just send out an email blast to everyone. You want to have people in categories based on what they're interested in, whether it be particular product categories or particular, you know, even if someone's downloaded a certain lead magnet, for example, you want to be able to tag that within your email system so that you know what they're interested in. So for example, I, in my business, would want to know if someone was interested in Facebook ads versus SEO, because it may tell me a little bit more about where they are in their journey. So, and the same with products as well. You can see by what people are purchasing from your store, how well they may know your brand and if they're likely to repeat purchase. That's another thing with email marketing. It's really good for repeat purchases and retargeting people. So you want to consider all of those things, particularly when you're segmenting and setting up even nurture streams. So there's two different types of emails that you can send out. There's email blasts that go out to everybody and then there's nurture streams. So when you segment people, you can set up emails that are going out say once a week to keep that particular segment nurtured and to make sure that they are getting a constant reminder of you. But not all, not only that, they're also driving traffic back to your website so that you're building up that your conversion rate as well because the more people that are seeing your products, being reminded of your products, the more likely that they are going to convert and you are going to make money. Mm, got you. And so what are the, some of the merging trends we're going to see for email marketing? Are we going to see EA? AI help with making lists for you and understanding like the customer. Are we going to see AI? Well, I'll probably obviously see AI already writing copy for everybody. Are we going to see more AI implementations within email marketing because AI is like the big marketing topic of this year and probably beyond? Yeah. So I think we are definitely going to start to see more and more cool new features coming out with email marketing. So I think they're going to be able to really get creative in the way that you are able to personalize the email marketing experience. So instead of just being able to send out a blast to everyone, we're going to be able to start to get more personalized in the way that we market our emails, which is really exciting because a lot of that personalization got, was, was halted really when all these privacy started coming in. So privacy policies. So I don't know if you've seen, but there's been a whole bunch of new privacy policies in the EU, particularly in Europe, so in the GDPR. So that's really made it harder to be able to market to people. So being able to personalize in a way that is, I guess, legal and follows all the kind of guidelines is really exciting. But then also helping our productivity. Everybody is really time poor. And a really great thing about AI is that it helps us get our time back. So if it is implementing features that help us write the copy or write variations of the copy for different segments, using different headlines or email subject lines, if AI can help us write all of those things and make the process a lot more streamlined, we are going to get a lot more time back and we are going to increase our performance because all of this software has so much data available at their fingertips. So it's going to completely transform what we do. And if we aren't on board, then we are going to fall behind. Obviously, there is still a huge component where you need a human because we want to be able to humanize the content. And we know that people like Google are going to be able to see whether things are robotic and whether things are genuine and actually have that human touch because we are still speaking to humans. We just want to use all of these tools to help us make our job easier and quicker, but yeah, still include that human touch. All right. People listen to this and they probably want to know where can they find you online? So where can people find you online to learn more about what you do? 
Yes, amazing. So you can find me at the digital exchange.co. And if you want access to that freebie I mentioned, so if you want to find out if your meta ads are, if you're ready for meta ads before you spend any money, you can go to the digital exchange.co forward slash Facebook. The tutorials I mentioned are on YouTube. I am at the digital exchange and then Instagram is the digital exchange.co. So that's where you can find me. If you need any help or tutorials, feel free to DM me. All right. Any final thoughts for listeners? Oh, I would just say if you haven't implemented your search engine optimization, I think that is a great place to start. A lot of people are omitting that particular area. That is where you get ranking on Google and get free traffic. So I would get that sorted. Then I would move into paid ads. So paid ads are my absolute favorite, but they are a scaling tool. So remember, to use some organic tools for growth and then move into your paid tools for when you're ready to scale. But don't forget to also get on the email marketing train if you haven't, because that has a really high return on ad spend and you're likely to see very good results. And don't worry if you can't create an email every week, start with a month or what you can manage and then move on from there. All right. Thank you, Nicole, for joining Digital Coffee Marketing Brand, sharing your knowledge on Facebook ads and email marketing. Of course. Thank you for having me. Can't wait to hear the episode comes out. Yes. And thank you. As always, please subscribe to this podcast and all your favorite podcasts. Yeah, to the five-star review. It really does help with the rankings. And as always, guys, join us next week as we talk to a great thought leader in the PR and marketing industry. All right, guys, stay safe. It's understanding Facebook ads. If you need to do it right now or wait and get on that email marketing train. See you next week. Later.